Okay, you ready? I'm going to really talk about film now for an hour. We're just going to have a good talk about film. Right up here, we go. Number one thing, you know, whenever we go into a, a new medium, I like to try to describe what's unique and special and significant about that medium. And when I think about film, I think, oh man, I know that books should be my favorite medium. And I know that if I had to choose only one medium in some crazy Twilight Zone type situation that I was only going to get to live with for the rest of my life, I should choose books. But I have to go for movies. One of you guys, all right, movies just the coolest, greatest thing. I mean, what gets you more excited than a movie? I mean, I, I really do like music and certain bands, and I get pretty excited when I hear a new song, but man, I'm like such a nerd. I'm so looking forward to the Avengers movie this summer. I watched Thor last night for the fourth time just to make sure I'm all ready for it. And I like Thor. Yeah, Kenneth Branagh, he did a good job with it. I was a Thor fanatic when I was 12 years old, so I mean, it's just like really, really excited about it. And I mean, I could remember a number of really just exciting experiences I had. I think I've told the story in this class where, you know, I was 12 years old when Star Wars came out and I'm sitting there in the movie theater, this unbelievable comic book nerd, science fiction guy, you know, and the lights go out and the, the words start coming over the screen and then it's the big battle cruiser and it's going and it's getting bigger and bigger and you're sitting under it and you're seeing all these ships shooting around and you're like, wow, how big is that thing? And I'm like eight seconds into the movie and I'm literally having the thought, this is the greatest movie I've ever seen, you know? And I was just like, so, I just remember being 12 years old watching Star Wars in the theater and just edge of my seat so excited about it, you know? I mean, it was just like the thrill of my life up to that point, I think, was watching Star Wars in the, in the movie theater. And then there's a number of, of movies that have come out, even in my adult life, that have had that kind of experience with definitely The Matrix. I, I'm a sci-fi guy. I love The Matrix. And I knew I was going to like The Matrix, and so I avoided all advertising. I didn't read a review about it. I just went and saw The Matrix cold, and I actually got to be surprised in the middle where he realizes he's living in a, in a collective uh, hallucination, you know. Anyway, it was really fun. Pulp Fiction is another one that I remember it so well, being in the theater and just being thrilled the whole time I was in the theaters. What an exciting experience, you know. So what is it about film that can do that sort of thing? And I'm sure that you guys have some similar experiences that you can relate to. And there's this sense that we know that in our culture. We know we're not really supposed to have too much respect for TV and we have a lot of respect for film. Although we all also know that in the last decade or so, there's been a lot of really good TV shows made, and TV's kind of climbing up the ladder a little bit with certain groups, certainly particular shows, and particularly you know, Sopranos, Mad Men. Um, now Crown of Thorns is my new favorite kind of cool show. And meanwhile, there's so many crappy movies that get made, but still we know every once in a while like a really good movie that's filmed. Anyway. So what is it about film that, 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 that does that for us? I, oh, yeah, go for it. Imagine trying to read Star Wars in a book. Right. Just that gigantic triangle coming through, like you were saying, you bigger and bigger. You, your imagination couldn't grasp what he was trying to do. Right. So it sort of makes your imagination a little more lazy while you're doing movies, because there, you're doing it through the director's eye, his imagination, yeah. where books, you're I don't know. It should be good as well when it comes to big sceneries and stuff like that, but when it came to that spaceship, there's stuff that you just can't do on the Yeah, right. right. I, I, I guess I could kind of agree with that, but on the same note, when I was younger and I read um, like all of the Lord of the Rings books, like all the 12 or however many books there are collectively, my imagination and what I thought about them was way better than what the movies were. You know what I mean? Just the whole Elijah Wood thing and all that, that just ruined it for me, you know? So I think it can be the opposite as well. Sure. I guess it just depends if you had read the book first. Because obviously if you've seen the movie first and you see the triangle and all that, you know, then you have preconceived conceptions. But, I don't know. 
Yeah. Well, I think this is a typical, I mean, both things that you said are kind of typical responses. I mean, on the one hand, people say, oh, the book is always right. You know? But on the other hand, there's something about being in the cinema that's very visceral. You know, it's, right. it's, 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 they're different. We all know that. Books and movies are different. You know, even if, if the movie is true to the book, it's very, it's a very different experience to read the book than it is to, to watch a movie. And the thing about watching a movie, particularly, I mean, in the theater with a the big screen, is that screen is just so big, and the colors are so bold, and the sound is very good, and, you know, it's only really with film in a theater that you get that experience where you're watching the movie, you're sitting there watching a movie, you're shoulder to shoulder with a bunch of people, you know where you are, and yet at the same time there's a moment where when you're watching the movie, you forget that you're watching the movie, and you're in the movie, you know? And when somebody jumps out with a knife, you jump back and scream. You know, it's just so fully immersive. And I think it has to do with the way that cinema takes up your whole sensorium. You know, your whole visual field is, is, is filled orally. It's all around you. You know, A, you are orally. Yeah, Corey. Um, I, I, is it okay if I say something? No. This, is, this is totally backing your uh, yeah, point. Just totally but... flip the camera. <laughs> <laughs> But on, on Mondays, on like every Monday, my friend started this thing, it's uh, called the Manly Monday Movie Mandate. And so we, uh, me and a couple of friends just go to the movies every single Monday. Nice. And it's actually, we've seen some crappy movies, but they've, but they've been fun and it's been like a joy to watch them just because of the people there and like the fact of going to a movie theater. Something that, that's different than watching it in your, right. in your living room, I think. So. And have you been watching guy movies? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, we, we so have. It's one of these areas where there's a gender difference. You know? Yeah, we, we went and saw Underworld, the Underworld that came out, and that was like, it was kind of a, I didn't like it a ton, but it was fun to watch because of the guys I was with. Yeah. Anyone have a favorite movie they want to share or a favorite movie experience? What's your Star Wars? Well, not necessarily a favorite movie, but I saw a Safe House not too long ago. Safe House. And then the sorry, just a badass. Yeah. That was a badass. <laughs> yeah. That was one of those movies that we did on the mandate ones. Did you ever see Malcolm X? I've heard. You great should see about Malcolm X. If you haven't seen Malcolm X, you should see it. Have you seen any Spike Lee movies? A couple ways. Which ones? It's a test. The older ones. The older ones. <laughs> There was Jungle Fever, there was um, School Days, there was, what's the one, the first one, the black and white ones that you did with the one. Do the Right Thing. Do, there was Do the Right Thing, that I can't believe I messed with that Yeah. We do Wicked Witch Days every night, kind of like the man Monday thing. Yeah. Like, we turn it into a book club kind of a deal where when you go in, there's super strict rules, you lock the door, and nobody's allowed to leave. And, like, nobody's allowed to come in bed late and throw all of our phones in a basket and try to make it, like, as scary as possible. We're not allowed to talk or anything. And then afterwards, we talk about it and break it and stuff. It's kind of cute. It's pretty cute. So wait, you do this at somebody's house with a horror movie, or what's yeah, the deal? Yeah, we just choose like all that best Alfred Hitchcock movies. Oh, just good. like all the best scary movies. Wonderful. I like that. Way good scary movie, and if I don't know if you've done this yet, but it's it's such a good. It's my favorite thriller movie. It's called The Changeling. It came out in like the late seventies, like seventy nine. It's with George it on Netflix. George Scott. The, the the wheelchair. The the cover. It's like. I was like, eh, pass. My, it's, it's my favorite horror movie of all time. It's awesome. Yeah. The Changeling, I would get that. Yeah. I don't watch a lot of horror movies, but some of them I've really liked. And did you see Red State, by the way? Yeah. Uh -huh. Kevin Smith's latest movie was a horror movie. That oh, really? a strong political statement about that group, that Baptist church group that protested soldiers' funerals and has signs that says, Yeah, yeah. Hates Kevin guys. Smith did a scary movie? Yeah. I'm yeah. gonna watch it for sure. It's super. Man, he did a good job. Costume was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I, saw, I got to see that Sundance with Kevin Smith. 
Really? That's awesome. And he came out and gave me a guitar. Anyway, let me uh, keep pushing out. So I just try to say some things about what makes the medium special and unique. Here's some other things I'll point out about the medium. Um, first of all, like all new media, it didn't emerge fully formed. Like there was a series of technological inventions that, that, that came together in the early 20th century. And even then, what, what was cinema going to be? It evolved over a period of time into a storytelling medium. At first, it was just an odd spectacle, and you know, it would be like an arcade, and they had Nickelodeons, and you put a nickel into a machine and look inside of it, and you'd see some crazy oddity, you know, a, a, somebody swallowing a sword or a strong man, or but like half of them were like dancing ladies showing their their legs, you know, that was mostly what it was. It was kind of had this kind of seedy kind of um, 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 connotation to it. And then it evolved over time into a, a storytelling medium. And, you know, that, that, that part's in the book. I don't want to go into too much detail on that. But it's just, it, again, it, it's worth it to understand that it wasn't instantly fully formed into the 90-minute feature film that, that we're familiar with. The book has a nice little section, too, where it talks about the visual significance of, of cinema and the idea that in the early 20th century, we have photography and cinema sort of come up after basically you know, 400 years of print culture, then suddenly we were in a visual culture. And the birth of cinema coincided with something that we've talked about here before, the, the heyday of the Industrial Revolution. It was part of the process and experience of what sometimes people call modernity. You know, this, the great change that, that swept the world in the late 19th and early 20th century, where we switched from being an agrarian to an industrial sort of civilization. There was this massive uprooting of people from their traditional towns and villages and movement and concentration of people into urban areas who were then sort of having this thing, this classic experience that like the sociologist Durkheim I believe called N NUI. You know, this, this sense of a lack of meaning in people's lives, a sense of disorientation, confusion, that the, the world had gone topsy-turvy, and all the familiar landmarks that people used to use to define themselves and their identities and their relationships to the communities around them suddenly just got uprooted and mixed around and condensed, and you're surrounded by thousands and thousands of people, but you don't know any of them. I mean, that's like the, you know, that's the typical way that they describe that experience of, of living in the cities in the first part of the 20th century. And into this world comes photo magazines and cinema. And oftentimes people make the observation that cinema filled a certain function for people. It provided, once it became the storytelling medium, with this familiar cast of characters that people would see again and again, and, you know, e.g. in the Western, you know, there's the good guys and the bad guys, and you know, the town in trouble, and you know, here comes the hero, that kind of thing, and these stock figures showing up in these narratives. That cinema came to function as a means of locating oneself culturally and giving oneself a meaning and a place in the world because you could identify with certain characters would be like you and other characters maybe would be like you know people in the world that you're familiar with and suddenly cinema became the sort of dominant storytelling medium whereby people began to explain their experience of the world to themselves and their understanding of themselves to themselves right and it sort of, in that sense, was a cure to the problem of the disorientation and dislocating impulses of 
industrial modernity. And so cinema became really popular, really important, um, you know, particularly in the American imagination around the figure of the cowboy. You know, we're still considered cowboys in global culture. You know, the cowboy is, I would make the argument that in a way, for most of the lived experiences of Americans <coughs> today, we think we define themselves by our values as depicted in the Constitution, but really we define ourselves by our values as depicted in the Western, right? That's what it means to be an American. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, I'm, I'm a rugged individualist, and I, I have the ethics of, of the, the city but the strength of the wild frontier, you know what I mean? Because that's what the cowboy is. I mean, you know, the, 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 that figure of, of, of the cowboy, I mean, think about it, he exists on the frontier. The frontier is a uniquely American phenomenon, you know, that, you know from, from our founding until, well, the close of the frontier would have been at the end of the 19th century. So at that moment when we were having, you know, the, the frontier <laughs> closed, when we were having this industrial, moment and then suddenly that became the sort of backward looking thing that we used to define who we were and what our character was and what that meant was that if America was fundamentally about the frontier experience you know that what is the frontier the frontier is a border between two different types of worlds you know on the one world it's civilization it's law it's commerce it's business it's orderliness, it's discipline, it's regulation, it's clean, it's strict, it's hierarchical. You know, that's what civilization is. In the wilderness, on the one hand, is dirty and wild and lawless and rough and tumble, right? And the cowboy represents a figure who crosses over those two boundaries and thus winds up getting the best of both. Because he's got the ethical heart of a civilized person who's not going to go around acting like a barbarian and, and killing anyone in his way. But on the other hand, by virtue of having been a cowboy and lived on the wild frontier and slept out in the woods and done the hard work that, that cowboys do, the cowboy is very strong and resourceful and capable. And in him is a little bit of both, because on the one hand, he owes his ethics to civilization, but on the other hand, he himself is not burdened by it. He's free. He's, he's something of a rebel. He's kind of a bad boy. You know, he's not going to do well at the fancy dinner party where the lawyers and the doctors are, you know. But if somebody needs help, he's the guy that you're going to call. That's what a cowboy is. And anyway, that, that figure is, I believe, has come to define the American character. That's how we understand ourselves. And look at the other Hollywood genres, even though the Western isn't popular anymore today, I would make the argument that the Western is still popular. As a matter of fact, the Western is in every genre. Every genre has a Western. Now, every cop movie is a cowboy movie. Every science fiction movie is a cowboy movie, you know? Even movies that you wouldn't think would be cowboy movies are kind of cow how core movies are cowboy movies. Love stories are cowboy movies. You know what I mean? Like that that figure is in American cinema so deep right now. You know, there, there's a cowboy character in every single movie. Yeah. Like, and we and love him. He's the guy. He's the Tom Cruise guy or the Matt Damon guy. Or and I I never really like depicted that until you told me that last semester. And uh -huh. now that that's seriously like. My perfect definition for like, a, like an American, like that, that's the ideal, like right. when in, in people in Europe, like I have relatives and stuff that live right. in Norway, and they're just like, we picture everyone just being like, you know, like like cowboys. <laughs> I'm just like, that's awesome, but no. <laughs> <laughs> but on the other hand, that's certainly how they view our military, both in the best ways and in the worst ways, mm -hmm. you know, because yeah, our military kicks butt, but they're crazy. <laughs> you don't want the cowboy hanging out too much. You know, you only want them when you want them. Yeah. So the early westerns were all that. They were all, you know, there'd be a town, there'd be a tragic cowboy figure in the background. You know, suddenly the town would be over, overrun 
by lawless banditos and Shane, you know, would have to run in and clean up the town, but then he'd have to go ride off into the, the west and be little Timmy yelling, Shane, come on. <laughs> and then they got more more confidence. But anyway. Um, so that's So um, in the early days, going back to the beginning of American cinema with, in the silent era, and by the way, has anyone ever seen I hear there's a new silent movie out. They got it now. The Artist? Academy, I gotta go see it. Is it good? Have you seen it? I, I haven't seen it. I heard it reviewed on NPR, but I can't remember what they said about it. It was, well, it was a couple weeks ago. It got the award one best picture. It won everything? Okay, I got it. It didn't come out in the theater here, but once it was. I'm trying to remember. There's some really famous people. No, it did come out in the theater here, actually. Yeah, it was in Provo. 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 It was I can't believe I can't remember. I remember seeing the previews, like some some dude gets screwed over by some chick like three or four times through the movie or something like that. I don't remember. It's it's around that. I've seen that movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's life. <laughs> well, I'll just say that um, if you haven't seen any silent movies, you should watch them sometime. They can be really good. I'm a particular fan of Charlie Chaplin. They're just like so great, and they're so much fun to watch. Has anyone seen a Charlie Chaplin? Oh no, only a few of them. Oh man, they're so worth watching. They're just fantastic. Yeah, but anyway, sorry, Charlie Chaplin's movies where he starts talking are not as good. What? The Great Dictator after that one. But The Great Dictator was a great movie. It was, but after that, his, his talking wasn't as good because he had to rely on. Versus but, but the great dictator was so good and it was a talkie. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Huh. Now I remember talking. what the that one was amazing. Yeah. Now I remember yeah. what the preview After was. After watching that and then all those other talkies from that point on. Okay, that could be. That's what the artist is about, the transition from silence to uh, how he deals with that. It's okay, fun. good. I'm gonna watch it over spring break and maybe lecture on it when I come back. What is spring break? Did you see it? I've seen everything about it. My in-laws are coming in next week and I thought, well, at least I'll have to go to school, you know? So, in, in the days of uh, the silent films, what emerged in Hollywood has come to be known as the studio system. And the studio system was how the economics of the business of making movies was organized. And it takes its name from the fact that the studios had total control over everything, right? And what you would do if you were an artist, whether you were an, an actor or a director or a screenwriter or whoever you were, you were under contract to the studios and they would just pay you a salary and you did whatever they told you to do and your salary was, was consistent regardless of how much money your films made and you didn't have the option of choosing this script or turning down that movie as you did what you were told to do and that was it. And that was what they had for quite a while. Um, they tell the story in the textbook of uh, there was a little bit of a revolt against the studio system. Once some of the silent stars started to realize that they really had the power with the audiences and they didn't need to sort of let the studios use them as virtual slaves. Because just like it is for you guys in your experience, I mean, I know if a Quentin Tarantino movie's coming out, oh, and by the way, Inglorious Bastards, add it to the list. Of I just couldn't believe it. Why? You really thought that one was that good compared oh, to his other ones? Oh, God. I, was I didn't think so. Every scene 
every scene was so exquisitely perfect and I think the first scene the where the people are hiding under the oh under, that the was most, a good it's scene. One of the most intense and it was okay I've ever when the dude. Seen every scene. No, I mean, the, no. the scene in the basement. <laughs> that was oh intense, God. dude. Oh my God. I, there were a couple of scenes, but I think as far as like his all of his movies and like in a, like that's not one of his really good ones. I don't think. I'm sorry, you're wrong and you fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that movie compare anywhere compares to like Pulp Fiction or even Jackie Brown or any of those other ones. Well, they're all great. But anyway, the point I want to make is that I hear Quentin Tarantino movies coming out, and I'm all excited, right? Unlike, for example, if I hear, um, you know, a Disney movie is coming out, or, you know, some studio. Who cares what studio made the movie? You want to know who's the director and who's it starring. That's what, that's what drives you into the movies. And that was what a few of the, of the popular <coughs> artists figured out back in the silent movie days. And a few of them got together. It was Errol Flynn and Charlie Chaplin and Mary Pickford. If you never saw Mary Pickford, you should watch a movie with her and see the cute women back in the 1920s too. She was just so cute. Anyway, um, they, they broke off onto their own and they formed United Artists. And uh, it was like, it sort of operated outside the, the studio system for a while. But the studio system remained intact until a famous court case, uh, Supreme Court case, um, that was decided, I think, in 1948. It's come to be known as the Paramount decision. And what had happened is back in the studio days, they had, not, they had control not only of the artists, but they had a lot of control over the, the theaters. First of all, the, the studios owned a lot of theaters directly, and so they just can directly control them that way. But also, because they had such a monopoly on, on films to show, when they were negotiating with independent theaters about which movies they were going to play, they would force the independent theaters to to take and show their unpopular movies if they wanted to have their popular movies also. And it was kind of like how Microsoft got into trouble for bundling certain software things. And it, it became this sort of um, anti-competitive thing. The independent theater owners didn't want to show the lame movies. They only wanted to show like the Errol Flynn type movies that were going to bring in an audience. And they wound up suing um, Paramount for I assume it was uh, um, an, uh, antitrust um, sort of uh, business where, um, you know, suing them for having an anti-competitive monopoly. And in 1948, Paramount lost the case in the Supreme Court, and they were forced to, among other things, divest themselves of their um, theater holdings, and they had a stopped doing the practice that they called block booking, where they would only sell you know, groups of, of, of movies to, to the, the theater owners. And it opened up the conditions for what emerged in Hollywood after, which is really what we have today, which is called the star system. And the star system is where everyone's a kind of semi-independent, or more of an independent, autonomous actor, and they enter into agreements to do particular films. Right, and so, and it, it, it's named from the fact that the stars have all the power. You know, Brad Pitt can get a movie made. You know, you see this um, um, spoofed really well in the movie. Okay, it's with the guy that was in Bob Roberts. He's the liberal guy who hangs out with Susan Sarandon a lot. The player, Tim Robbins. Um, the, the, the movie, have you seen The Player? Has anyone seen it? It's a really, you guys don't know this. There's been so many great movies. The Player is a great movie that spoofs a lot of the inside nature of Hollywood. And it follows, it's sort of done in a kind of realistic way. And it follows this uh, Hollywood movie producer. Um, and it winds up becoming like a, a murder mystery. And, um, Anyway, 
as you're following this movie producer through his life, he's constantly listening to pitches for movies, and every pitch basically is the same, you know. <laughs> and uh, the pitches are, it always have to take the form of, you know, it's this meets this, you know. So it's on the waterfront meets Jaws. <laughs> it's called. You know, it's, it always has to be like two movies, and then they always have to have like one or two stars attached to it. You know, but at the beginning, um, they'll say, I don't want any stars. We're going to keep this artistic, and we're not going to do a, a happy ending. Oh, and by the way, that's the other thing. <coughs> this thing has developed over the decades, and it goes back to the, the silent movie days. And there's, there's a particular style of, uh, well, there's a particular style of, of movie making that's come to be called the Hollywood style. And the Hollywood style is basically has characters, there's, it's, it's going to be driven by, um, the, the movie's going to stay with the main characters throughout the movie. And you're going to see them have some type of a conflict and then try to resolve it, and then it's going to seem like it gets resolved, but then it doesn't really get resolved, and then, oh, you get disappointed, and then it gets resolved, and it's a happy ending. Usually with a, a, a love story attached to it, like 98% of the time. That's the Hollywood style. And by the way, that's the other thing. Every movie is that movie that, that you see that, that comes out of Hollywood. Like it almost always has to be that kind of thing. Um, Anyway, so that's the, that's the Hollywood style, that's the star system, that's the studio system, that's the Paramount decision. I'm just going through my checklist, trying to hit my main points here. Oh yeah. <coughs> and then, another thing that's worth thinking about that's come to characterize Hollywood movies is what's come to be known as the blockbuster mentality. And, um, sometime, and it's, it's related to uh, the star system in a way, too. But the blockbuster mentality, and sometimes people identify this as beginning with the movie Jaws, which, you know, I remember Jaws so well. It was a huge cultural phenomenon in 1976. There was this best-selling book by Peter Benchley. It was like a really scary book, and a lot of people were reading it. It was about these shark attacks. It was the first adult novel I ever read. It came out, I was in the sixth grade, and my friends, my friend Todd Budnick read it. What's that book you're reading? That big fat book that you're all into. He's like, this is the coolest book ever. And so I read it, and that book scared the crap out of me. And I read it again, and then I lent it to somebody else. And anyway, we were all like huge Jaws fans. And then the movie Jaws came out, and it was just like, again, it was like Star Wars for me. It was just like the most exciting, scariest thing. Gave me nightmares. <laughs> I wrote about it actually. And I'll post it on, on the blog. I have the article. I tell a story about when I went to go see Jaws. But anyway, I, I and my friends did what a lot of people did in America with Jaws. They went to see Jaws on a, Saturday, on a Friday night, and they had like a great time, and they couldn't believe it. And the next night, they were sitting around, and they are like, what should we do tonight? And somebody said, I know. Let's go see Jaws again. And that was what people did. Like Jaws, people were going to see it two or three or four times, and it became this unbelievable, huge, gigantic hit. And that was uh, George Lucas, I believe. Well, no, it was Spielberg. Steve. It was Spielberg. Um, and then, the like a year or two later, Star Wars came out, and it was Jaws times times ten. And then after those two movies, that was what everybody wanted. They wanted a blockbuster. They called it, where it was just a movie that would just like be such a massive return on investment. And in, in some ways, people are making the argument that it screws up movies. You know, that's why we get crappy movies like the Transformers. You know, they're like they're like designed by a committee of businessmen and social psychologists trying to like put together the exact <laughs> formula for what is going to create a blockbuster. And you know, it has to have a huge amount of special effects and this much action and big name stars attached to it. So it's going to be. Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie and you know some well Brad Pitt though chooses good scripts always I think I don't think he's ever been in a bad movie has he? I have a person. Brad Pitt. Has he ever been in a bad movie? Yeah, he's ever been in a bad movie. Twelve Monkeys was so good. But anyway, yeah. Seven. Snatch. I didn't see Seven. 
Seven was good. It looked like Seven. you were just scared me too much. Yeah, yeah, it was way good. Yeah. Anyway, the blockbuster mentality, though, sometimes oh, it gets critiqued for, it, it ruins the possibility of a small, humble movie. You know, what about small, personal movies that wind up, you know, having a lot of, of, of impact? And I'm going to think about some right now. That Midnight in Paris. Yes. Have you seen oh. that? Midnight in Paris. I love Midnight in Paris. Yeah, Such a good movie. movie. Every Woody Allen movie, basically. 